isn't it? We went from almost 100 degrees and drier in the bones. I think we got seven and a half inches at home. Got six on Friday and inch half yesterday. So I noticed the creek out here is right up at the top again, just like it was in June when we got that burst. So um, God has really blessed us there. This week, um, I want to talk a little bit about, and we're going to get into Romans 19, uh, Romans 1, but there's been a, a consistent thing that happens when I talk to people that are oftentimes close to dying. They know they're dying. And especially when I talk to someone who's been raised in this area, grown in this area, grown up uh, in an agricultural situation. I, I find that I was blessed in that, but um, I want to talk about that a little bit today. So if you would, let's just join me in prayer as we start here. Father, I thank you so much that we are able to gather here today, Lord, that we can get into your word, Lord, and I just, I praise you so much for all the people that are gathered here. And Father, as, as we go into this service and we go into our worship, Lord, I pray your hand be on it, that our ears and our hearts be open to this. And Father, I just, I just pray that you give me the words that you want spoken. <clears throat> I ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I told Jane I was going to time myself up here today because the doctor told her she can't sit for more than 30 minutes at a time. <laughs> She's got my phone, so I really can't do that. But if you see her stand up, hopefully that's what she's doing and not just walking out. <laughs> right, so let's start with Romans 1, 19 through 20. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. I feel really grateful that I was raised in an agricultural environment and that I've always lived in one. Sort of my time being in the military, I've always been in the country. It bothers me to see my neighbors. I like to be in open space. And the reason for that is I love to see God's beauty. I like to see God's making, God's creation more than man's creation. I go to a city and I'm not all that awed by all the things in the city. That's all made by man. There's a reason when people take vacations, they have a tendency to go to places of God's great beauty. They go to the mountains. They go to the ocean. They go to places like that because God's beauty is so awesome. And it's awe-inspiring because we can't do it. We can't make it. But what I've seen a lot of times is I have people that will agree with this. Yep, they agree. God had to make all this stuff. Go ahead, Gab. Job 12, 7 through 10. But ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds in the sky and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you, which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. I think that's something that we all understand too, coming from where we're living. When I talk to someone and I say, do you know Jesus? My response often is, yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah, I believe that God exists. Well, the demons believe God exists. That's not enough. So yeah, it's evident and People can see what God did, but that's not enough. There's more to it than that. I love this passage out of Job because it's, it talks about things in the animals, birds, fish, all those other things. And if you talk to a biology teacher, they'll tell you all those things. There's so many neat things you can do when you're researching. You can go to the science is beautiful. And I think science is God sharing with us little pieces. When you look at a child and you see a child discover something for the first time, when the light bulb comes on, woo, it was so cool when we had VBS here and the, the theme was stellar, but I got imagination station. We did experiments like sucking an egg into a bottle through lighting a little fire inside the bottle and sucking an egg and all those kind of things. Boy, their faces just lit up. I love to see that. And I think God's the same way. That's what science was intended. We get to see more and more and more of the detail of what God did. God is in the big things in life. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. Psalm 19 is beautiful. If you read through the whole thing, it's gorgeous. 
But I just pulled this piece up, one through six. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. I love this passage because this is the big part of God. And nothing really makes you see the big part of God quite as much as looking at the sky. When we look at the night sky, when you look at something like that, the vastness of it. We can't even imagine the distance these little points of light are. How long it took for these things to come. This is the big part of God. And it's easy to feel the big part of God. And again, I, I'm grateful that I live in a place where I can see the stars. Because with light pollution in cities, do you know in a city they can't see the stars? They look up and there's nothing. Because they're in a bubble of light. They don't get to see these things. And again, people go on vacation, they go outside and they just stare. When you can actually see the Milky Way, when you can see those things in there. And a couple of little things here just to kind of clue you in on this. Jane's reading a really good book, and I didn't get to use that because she was still in bed this morning when I was writing. But the Earth exists in what's known as the habitable zone. Okay? Around the sun, if we were 5% closer to the sun, the distance we're at, if we were 5% closer, it would be 900 degrees on the surface of the Earth. Okay? <laughs> if we were 20% farther out, we would be solid ice. Completely frozen. No life would exist. And the elliptical rotation of the Earth is just perfect to keep the seasons going and to keep life on Earth. I, I remember as a kid, I'm sure just about everybody here did. Everybody did the planets, right? You did all the little styrofoam balls. And we always put them going in a circle. Because that makes sense to us. It's not a circle. It's an ellipse, which means it's longer on one end than the other. It's kind of an oval shape. It's really different. It's not what we would pick as humans to build. We like things symmetrical. We put things together like that, but it wouldn't work. The oxygen we're breathing right now is 21%. The air is 21% oxygen. If it was 19.5%, we would all have serious health problems and die from lack of oxygen. If, on the other hand, it went up to 23.5%, the actual air we're breathing would be flammable. That difference between 21% and 23.5%, that little tiny bit, yeah, that's not really accidental. There's more to it than that. The moon orbiting around the Earth is just perfect. It helps with the tilt of the Earth. It helps with the tides. If the ocean was 10 feet deeper than it is, the bottom of the ocean was 10 feet deeper than it is, and the moon was 100 miles closer than it is, the tides would cover all the continents every day. The high tide would come over every continent on the earth. Everything is balanced. Everything is in such perfect unity and such perfect harmony. That's the only way all this works. And we look at that big stuff and we look at the big things. People look through the Hubble telescope and they see stars that nobody's ever seen before. And it goes on and on. Mankind has not found the end of the universe. It's just going on and on and on. We're trying to get bigger and bigger microscopes to see farther and farther. That's God. You know, God's also in the little things, in the tiny things. It's Psalm 139, 13 through 14. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. On this slide, you can kind of see the background. I got I to gotta always kind of dim it out so we can see the letters here. But you can kind of see that background. That's a little thing, not a big thing. That looks like the universe or a starburst, doesn't it? That's a microscopic view or a microscopic photograph of the iris of the human eye. That's what it looks like when you get close enough. And these little things right here, that is a microscopic photograph of the nerves that allow your eyes to operate. That's nerve endings in your eye. That's what a human eye's nerve endings look like. Isn't it amazing that we can actually... And that's not colored. That's the photograph. 
Isn't it amazing that we can even see that? God shows us these little things too. God's in the big things. God's in the little things. So yes, we have no excuse. We have no excuse to just say, well, yeah, okay. That has just happened. The, the, the concept of evolution where things just accidentally happen is just so strange to me. For some people, that's a religion. They don't want to exist. That there's a, they don't want to accept that there's a creator because if there's a creator, then there's someone above man. Someone greater than man. And that's true. But they don't want to accept that. So they try and say, well, it's all an accident. There was an explosion, and it just happened to turn into a rock and water and animals and fish and all these things. It just happened to be that way. There's no way that could be true. The odds are ridiculous. Talking about the little things, I'm going to read this to you. I thought this was interesting. This is from uh, uh, the guys, I'll probably mess his name up, Antony Van Leeuwenhoek. He is considered the father of, father of modern microbiology. He was the one who developed the microscope that we use today. And this is a quote from him. From all these observations, we discern most plainly the incomprehensible perfection, the exact order, and the inscrutable providential care with which the most wise creator and Lord of the universe had formed the bodies of these animacules, which are so minute as to escape our sight, to the end that different species of them may be presented in existence. And this most wonderful disposition of nature with regard to these animacules for the preservation of our species, which at the same time strikes us with astonishment, must surely convince all of the absurdity of those old opinions that living creatures can be produced from corruption of putre putrefaction. He was looking at slides of single cell organisms, the things you can't see with the naked eye. And he said, this is God. <coughs> These things are God. You know, it's, it's a strange thing, and, and science teachers get to have aha moments all the time. It's really cool. I don't know, Gabby, if you've done this in class before, but have they ever taken, like, pond water and put it under a microscope, and you can look and see things swimming in it? You can't see it in the water, but you see it on the slide? You don't have microscopes. You don't have microscopes. Well, that's a shame. <laughs> I remember the first time I had a teacher take a scraping in your own mouth and put it under there and see the living things. Ew. They're necessary. <laughs> They're necessary for our body to exist. There is a symbiotic relationship with the entire universe that makes everything work together. Sometimes we can see it, sometimes we can't. When babies are born, we see it. When people die, we see it. We see the beginning, we see the end, we see all the things in between. So we know that God exists. We know that God exists. That's not enough yet. One of the other things we need to remember is that God is still here and God is still working. When Da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa, which people think is the most beautiful painting in the world, I don't agree, I don't understand it, but some people really like the Mona Lisa. Da Vinci's dead. He created the Mona Lisa. He was the creator. He's the only one that made that painting. Everybody else can copy it, but it's never going to be the same, right? There's only one original painting. But that creator of that painting no longer exists. He died. He's gone. <coughs> the creator of the universe, on the other hand, is still active. Uh, this is Jeremiah 10, 10 through 13. It says, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal king. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. Tell them this. These gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. But God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the water, waters in the heavens roar and he makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. <coughs> Very descriptive language here. And part of what Jeremiah is talking about, it says, Tell him these gods do not make the heavens and the earth. Early man, before an understanding of God came about would look at creation and try and make the creation God. They would worship the creation. The sun was one of the most powerful things. So you get the Egyptians and the Aztecs and all those other cultures that made the sun the God. You get other ones that have rain gods. 
here in the United States, uh, if you went down to the southwestern area where it's desert and rain is the only thing that keeps you alive, they had rain gods. All these different things. But in reality, the only true God is the one that created it all. God created all of it. And he is a living God. The creator is not done with his creation. He didn't paint it, put it on a wall, and walk away. God has never taken his hand off of us. If he did, I I think we'd spin out of control and we'd be gone. Part of the reason that God has to keep his hand on us now is sin. The reason we have death, the reason we have decay, the reason we have diseases, the reason we have all these things is because we brought, man brought sin into God's creation. And And that sin affects all of God's creation. Everything. People talk about the ozone layer and and the atmosphere and all the problems there. Well, you know what? We did that. Disease, decay, death. We did that. That wasn't God's intention when he created us. But in God's love and his grace, he keeps us going through our own (coughs) sin. He keeps the world here, even though we probably should have not existed anymore. We probably should have completely destroyed the earth by now. God holds it all together. I was talking to a man, unfortunately, just um, this this year. And he was, he'd been sent home, was on hospice. Knew he was short time. Ranch kid, truck driver, construction guy, did all sorts of different things. And I said, where are you at with your faith? I sat down with him. I said, "Where, where are you at? Well, I know God exists. I said, okay. What about your relationship with him? Well, I know he's working. Otherwise, we'd have, we'd have destroyed it all by now. He said, I look at what's going on in the world, and there's got to be a God out there holding us together. I said, how about you personally? Well, he started giving me some excuses. You know, I'm not a religious guy. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about relationship. What's your relationship with the Creator? Well, no, he hummed and hawed, and I said, okay. Eventually, I said, okay, I'll come back a couple of days. You think about this. That was on a Thursday. He died on Friday. I was scheduled to come back on Saturday. Didn't work. Didn't work out. Now, what is, I have no idea what happened between the time I talked to him and the time he died. I have no idea if he gave his life to Christ in that moment in time. But when I was talking to him, he, had st- he was still refusing to make a relationship. Still refusing to take that separate step. Still refusing that one little piece. Go ahead, Gail. Go ahead. Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very heads of your ha- hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid, you're worth more than many sparrows. Jesus is saying, God knows everything that's going on, is watching everything. He's watching his creation right now. He knows every single living creature. He knows everything that's going on. And when he says, two sparrows sold for a penny, he's talking about at that time, remember the temple was doing sacrifices. And for, based on your income and what sin you were asking to be forgiven for, you would bring different sacrifices. If you were extremely poor, you would buy doves. If you were extremely, extremely poor, maybe all you could get was a sparrow. So you would buy two sparrows and take them in for your sacrifice. That's the lowest you could possibly be. That's it. Two sparrows for a penny. That's the lowest thing you get, the lowest amount of money you could possibly have, and that's the lowest sacrifice you could have had. So he's saying, you know, sparrows are inconsequential. They're not a big deal. But even God, God loves even the sparrows and knows about them right now. And he, know, he can count every hair on your head. It's numbered. He knows all those things. God is active right now and watching and doing right now. John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I put this up here for a reason. 
I know a lot of people who might call themselves Christian or might not <coughs> can give you John 3.16. Growing up as a kid, I remember distinctly as a young child, um, we, and from a very early age, we watched the best football team on the, in the world. Oh, uh, that was the Vikings. Um, and every time you watch a professional football game, somebody would be holding up a sign that said John 3.16 on. Everybody knew that. It was all over the place. Most people have heard John 3.16. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. But there's what they don't have is 17. So if you ask someone, have you ever heard this, and you give them John 3.16, they'll say yes. Doesn't mean they believe anything. They've just heard it before. But if you believe 17, that's a little bit different. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the key. <laughs> if someone says, yeah, I know John 3, 16, give him 17. There is no condemnation in Christ. That's not why he's here. That's not what it's about. So many people are afraid to say they're religious or <laughs> walk through that door on a Sunday morning because they're afraid of judgment, right? That's the one thing they don't want. They do not want to. They do not want to be confronted with judgment. Not from us. And not from God. There's a lot of people out there that ex that know that God exists, but they're afraid to meet Him because they're, they're afraid that they will there will be condemnation, that God will judge them. And this passage right here says that's not what happened. God loved it loved the world so much he sent his son not to condemn the world but to save it. There's no reason to fear approaching God. There's no reason to fear coming to his son. There's hope and there's joy and there's love there. So it's one thing to exist to know that the creator exists. It's one thing to acknowledge that God is real. It's one thing to acknowledge that God is working right now. It's still not enough. You have to go deeper than that. There are people that say, well, God is love, so I don't have to worry about it. Really? He says a lot more, too. Yes, God is love, but we are sinners. And the wages of sin are death. And there's no way out of that except his son. That's what people need to understand. That's what they need to understand about the creator is, yes, he created us. Yes, he is active. Yes, he's got his hands on us right now. Yes, he's holding it all together. Yes, he has a place for us. If we follow his son, he has a place for us. Because if you believe that God exists and you believe that Jesus exists, then you cannot deny what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you aren't going through Jesus, you aren't getting there. And you will be part of that creation that perishes against God's will. He doesn't want anybody to perish, but you're going to be part of that creation that perishes, perishes because you haven't gotten to that point where you have followed what Jesus said. <laughs> Seeing is not enough. Go ahead, Gary. Hebrews 11, 3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made, was not made out of, of what was visible. Keep going. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you can imagine someone in the universe with the power to create the beauty that we have that God created for us, the power to create this beauty, you ever think about the fact that God didn't need to make color? The whole world could have been black and white, we wouldn't have known any different. We still would have been breathing and having children and raising families and working and doing all those kind of things that we wouldn't know that it wasn't supposed to be black and white. God put color there. Why? Because he wants us to enjoy it. Because it's special. The sun sets on these days when we got the clouds in the background and the sun is reflected off the clouds. and the God paints the most beautiful paintings every single day. Every single day, he had something new. He had something gorgeous. He had something special just for us to enjoy. He, doesn't, he didn't stop creating. But if God created something that beautiful, do you think he wants it to be trashed and dead and decaying and gone? Of course not. 
Da Vinci wouldn't take a masterpiece, put it on the wall, then throw it in the fire and walk away from it. Oh no, he painted that masterpiece and he put it on the wall and people still to this day want to go see. God's creation is the same way. God doesn't want the creation to fail and to fall and to decay and to die and to just rot away. He wants it to be saved. He wants to save us. We are his creation. He wants to save us. We are, are greater than the sparrow. We are watched. God knows everything about you. And he wants you to have a relationship with him so he can save you. So he can pull you personally, one at a time, pull us out of the fire. Because he knows that's where it's going. The ship is going down, and he's the only way out. And he says, just stick out your hand, I'll grab it and pull you out. That's it. That's all it is. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For by, by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. You can't do it by yourself, you can't earn it, you can't do anything else. Except hold your hand out and say, I need you to take me. There is no other way. You can't be a good person and, and fulfill the law. You cannot be a good person and make it to heaven. You cannot be anything other than a follower of Jesus Christ and make it to heaven saved. You see all of creation now and all the decay that we have in it. Imagine what it looked like when God first created in the Garden of Eden. If you look in Revelations, it says God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Imagine what God can do without the influence of sin. What that's going to look like. I have no picture in my head of heaven. I have little flashes from the Bible things, but I can't grasp it. All I know is it's going to be greater than I can possibly imagine. James always saying, can you imagine what the fruit will taste like in heaven? Perfect fruit. She's an apple nut. She loves apples. So we're always going every place there's a grocery store. If we're in Rapid, we go to the grocery store. If, we, if we're in Eagle View, we go to the grocery store. We go wherever we have to to try and find apples. And I don't know, maybe it's just me, but apples seem to have gotten worse over the years. You think you get a good apple, then they're not good. And so she's bringing home bags of apples, and she'll get two or three kinds, because one of them's going to the horses. It's not going to be good enough. So she says, can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? I said, yeah, won't have to sort through the apples. We'll just grab the, everyone's best one. <laughs> That's what's waiting for us. That's what God wants for us. That's what he intended for us from the very beginning. So when someone says, yeah, I see God. Okay, now let's talk about what you've got to do after that to be with God. It's one thing to know there's a creator. It's another thing to be with the creator. That one little thing is sticking your hand out and asking for help. It's holding yourself. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you admit as you are drowning that someone has to pull you out, you will be saved. If you admit while you're in the fire that you need a fireman to come and put the fire out and pull you out of there, you will be saved. If you admit that there's nothing you can do to fix the world, there's nothing you can do to fix yourself, there's nothing you can do to fix the life you live, <coughs> you reach out to God and say, God, take me, change me, help me. If you reach out to God, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus is that pathway to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you accept that, that's the one thing you got to do. And the creator of the universe does everything else. But without that one thing, it's not possible. You have to give your life to Christ. It's that simple. It's that easy. God made the wisdom of the universe Simple, so that we could always figure it out. And he laid it out in his word. Simply, it's there. He sent his son not only to save us, not only to heal while he was here, not only to do the miracles he did while he was here, but also to give us the word. So that through his word, we would understand what is necessary. Romans 8, 38-39. For I am convinced 
that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing big, nothing little. Not life, not death. Not distance. Not shape, not color, nothing can separate us from the love of God through his son, Jesus. So right now, I want to put that out to you. If this is not something you've thought about before, I want you to think about it. This is not something you've put together before in your own mind. Put it together. Because if you are a believer, you are going to run into that person that doesn't know this, and you got to tell them. If you are a believer and you have family and you have loved ones, that you know are lost. Look and say, well, yeah, I, I, I believe God exists. They need to go farther. That's not enough. And you need to make it very clear that that's not enough. It's not enough to acknowledge the fact that God exists. You have to acknowledge the fact that we need him and that his son was sent to save us. <coughs> so I'm putting this out there for you today. If you haven't committed to this, what are you waiting for? If you have committed it to, committed to it, it should be speaking it. It should be coming out of you. It should be going out in the world. The creator of the universe loves you personally. Personally. So much that he sent his son to die just for you. Each and every one of us individually. And he said, All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need you. And I'll take care of everything else because I'm the creator of the universe. I sent my son, I held on my hands. What are you waiting for? Father, I thank you so much for the creation that you have, that you have given us, Lord, that you've given us beauty, that you've given us joy, that we have heat and cold, spring, summer, winter, fall. I thank you for rain, Lord. I thank you for sunshine. I thank you for day and night. I thank you for all the creation of this earth. But Lord, I thank you most for your son. I thank you for the, your son and the, and the love that you have shown us through him. That even though we sin and we are violating your, your law, that we have turned against you, Lord. That we lie and we cheat and we steal and we murder and we kill. When we do all these things as human beings, you still love us. And you sent your son to come to earth in the same shape and form as we are. To live with us to suffer and to die for us, to shed blood so that we could be reunited with you in the way you intended, Lord. Father, I lift up those that have not accepted this concept. I lift up those that don't understand that they have to have your son to reunite with you, to be what your creation really was intended to be. And Father, I lift up all of us that do know that, Lord, sometimes struggle to put it into words and explain it to people. Father, give us courage and strength and boldness as we go forward, Lord. Speak through us with your spirit. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.